Hi, this is Mr. Curtis. And since we have biology as our main topic in class, bio meaning life, I thought it's about time that we have a video on life. So we're going to be talking about, you know, the opposite of death. No, we're not going to be talking about the game of life. Although, wouldn't it be lovely to talk about it? Look at this guy with this lovely sweater on and everybody smiling. You know, mommy. Oh, everyone looks just so lovely. We're having a wonderful time. Maybe this is more likely the game that you have at home, the game of life with uh, SpongeBob. Well, that's not what we're going to be talking about either. We're going to be talking about living things. And first of all, let's begin with what is it what is it that all living things do? Well, all living things use oxygen. Either they use it to create energy or they use it as part of another process, but all living things somewhere somehow use oxygen. All living things need food, nutrients. Trees, yes, they need food. Where does that come from, by the way? All living things give off waste. Uh, some things a lot more. That little toddler that you had to babysit last week, boy, do they ever give off waste. Uh, all living things reproduce, or at least have the ability. So let me ask you, do you reproduce? That'll be a question for our discussion in class. And of course, all living things die. Even, for example, the bristlecone pines, which live 5,000 years, they eventually die. All living things eventually die. Well, let's talk about this. In humans, when did life begin? Well, obviously, this thing is alive, or at least what it represents the picture. Does it produce waste? Oh, yeah, it does. Uh, way tons of it, stinky stuff, too. So, where does life begin? Yep, this thing's alive. Let's move back from that thing uh, previously. Now, is this alive? Sure, this thing is alive. How does it get its food and oxygen, by the way? That is a question for our discussion in class. Yes, it has to do... Oops, been doing that a lot lately. Yes, it has to do with the umbilical cord, but let me ask you this question. Does this baby poop when inside? Put your answer down in the margin and tell me later. Moving back a little bit farther, is this thing alive? Well, sure it is. It does all the things that living things do. Uh, by the way, you can see a, a little tail here. Remember in our discussions of, well, we'll get into our discussions, I should say, of embryology. Uh, also at this point in time, you would find little gills right there. This thing is not an eye, but an eye spot. Now going back even farther, is this thing a fertilized zygote? Is that alive? Sure, absolutely. Gives off waste, takes in oxygen. Okay, moving back a little bit farther. Are the sperm and egg, the stuff that made that fertilized egg, is that, are they alive? Well, sure they are. That sperm was moving. It's using up energy. The same with that egg. Those things are alive. Are the people who made the um, sperm and egg... Are they alive? Sure, they're all alive. Well, if everything's alive, where does life begin? Well, the answer is, it doesn't begin or end. Life, for a species, is a cycle. In life, there is no beginning or end. That's for the species, unless, of course, it goes extinct. What about the individual? Well, now we get into a little more of a touchy subject. And uh, frankly, it's one that I really don't want to cover in seventh grade. So um, we'll move on to something else, shall we? So what is the answer to when life began? The short answer is no one really knows. 
However, there is a theory in science as to how life began on Earth. However, before we get to that, let's talk about some history. There used to be this old theory that explained how living things came about, and it's called spontaneous generation. Now, if we take this word apart, generation, that should mean something to you. That should mean to generate, like a generator. And spontaneous, that means it just all of a sudden happens. Kind of like spontaneous combustion. The theory said that living things came only from non-living things. For example, people used to believe that frogs and eels came from mud. They used to believe that if you could take rice and a dirty shirt, put it in a box, leave it outside for five or six days or whatever, poof, a mouse would appear. And something else they believed was that the actual dead fish made flies. Flies came directly from the dead fish. Well, as you can tell, this theory today, we would look at it and think of it as kind of silly. But as late as the 1880s, people still believe this. Joseph Lister believed the geese came from barnacles. In fact, there is something called a barnacle goose. Lister, mm, that name sounds familiar. Put an I-N-E at the end of it. Joseph Lister believed that geese came from this. And like I said, to this day, there is a kind of goose called a barnacle goose, which goes back to this old belief. Well, finally, this guy came along, Francesco Redi. He was the first to prove that spontaneous generation was wrong. Yes, the lovely hair. This is the experiment that he came up with. He took three vials, three jars, and he put dead fish in each of the three jars. And in the first jar, he left that completely open. The second jar, he closed up tight. And the third jar, he put a fine mesh over the top, something kind of like a screen, because I don't think they had screens at that time. And then he left them out in the hot Italian sun to see what happens. Oh, by the way, for Mrs. Almy's sake, what is the dependent variables in this experiment, and what are the independent variables. Put your answers in the side of your sheet, please. Well, here are the results. After a few days, of course, the open one had lots of flies on the inside where the dead fish was. So we had dead fish in here, flies all over the place. In the second one that was all closed up, of course, no flies. And the third one, there were flies but flies only buzzing around on the top. There were no flies on the inside where the dead fish was. So Reddy concluded, look, there's no flies, and if the fish were actually making the flies, there should be flies on the inside of the vial three. There was not. So he concluded that spontaneous generation was wrong. Well, guess what? Scientists didn't believe Reddy, and it took well over 200 years before they finally got around to it. This guy finally proved that spontaneous generation was wrong. His name was Louis Pasteur. Pasteur sounds like something else we'll get to in a second. Yes, he also came up with a cure for rabies, real interesting story. And he developed pasteurization. Uh, also an interesting story of what he pasteurized before milk and the reasons for that, ask me in class. Well, here's what his experiment was. Now, instead of working with dead fish, what he worked with was chicken broth. Sorry about my handwriting today. He worked with chicken broth. So all the stuff in chicken soup, except the vegetables and meat and everything else, just the water part, that's what he worked with. And he would put that into these vials. Now. If you just let chicken broth set out, it will become moldy on the outside. So people thought that it was the air that was causing things to get mold, that the air was alive, and that somehow the air touched it and made it come to life. Poof. The reason you and I are alive is not that we inhale air and our bodies use it. It's that the air itself was alive, and by us touching it, 
that's why we stayed alive. But then why wouldn't dead people come back to life? Hmm. Then Pasteur's second vial, he closed that up tight after boiling his chicken broth. And the third one, this is his true genius. He came up with this thing called a gooseneck tube. So that way, air could come into the tube and could go around and keep touching the chicken broth. This was open to the air. But what happened is the dust particles would get trapped in here. And so then what were his results? Well, the first one obviously left open. That was moldy. The second one, obviously, closed up tight, no mold. And the third one, no mold growing, which was amazing, proving that air could touch something, and yet it would not come to life. So even though the broth was open, it did not have mold, and the air did not bring the broth back to life, proving once and for all that spontaneous generation was a bad theory, and it didn't work. So, after all that, back to today's science theory of how life began. So we're talking billions of years ago, not millions, but billions of years ago, the Earth was very different than today. No oxygen, no plants, no animals, just rock, water, and a little bit of methane gas. That's it. Simple chemicals called nucleotides began to make more of one another. And eventually these nucleotides developed and started to evolve to produce parts of cells. This represents a mitochondria. From there, they would evolve over billions of years into a single-celled living thing. So we're not talking a slow change over a thousand years. We're talking about a slow change over billions of years, which eventually evolved to the animals and plants that we have today and our world. However, here's the paradox. By the way, a paradox is a self-contradicting statement that at first seems true. Listen to the song. Oh, if you want more, I'll play it later. In order for the theory of life to be correct, spontaneous generation had to have happened. But scientists proved the spontaneous generation was wrong. So which one is it? Which should lead to more of discussions in class, hopefully. Okay. So, now I want you to add a summary to the bottom of your sheet, answer a couple of those questions in which uh, I asked you to. We'll discuss this in class, and we'll see you next time.